There are many ways to build your fishing village, but when the resources and time are tight, choose wisely. In this re-implementation of 2017 game Santa Maria, Saltfjord. And today we'll be teaching you how to play Saltfjord, game designed by Christian Amundsen Ersby and Eilif Svensson and published by Aporta Games. And hello everyone, it's Stella and Tarrant from Meeple University. And hey, if you enjoyed this video, you really help us by liking it, let us know what you think and subscribe. Like, seriously, that would help us to bring even more videos. Okay, now let's get to the classroom. In Saltfjord, players represent rival Norwegian fishing villages trying to fish, expand, develop and trade, all in the aim of gaining points. Over three rounds of play, players will draft dice to activate the buildings in their villages, construct further buildings to increase their options, and do all they can to trade and manage their resources for points. The player with the most points over three rounds will be the winner. To set up, give each player a resource board, a village board which you can flip to its asymmetrical or symmetrical side, a boat flipped to its three slot unupgraded side, and these player components, everything in your colour, three dice of each colour and three workers. Unused such pieces are returned to the box, and also leave out the wagons, these are used in an advanced mode of play. All of these pieces, except for one worker, will begin on the main board. Place a player marker in the tavern and another at zero on the score track. Place a technology marker at the bottom of each tech track. Then put each player's second and third workers on the corresponding places, ready to be collected later. And a final scoring marker at the top of each column, returning the rest to the box. Shuffle all the crate tiles into four equal stacks of 11 placed face down, with a lighter coloured starting crate face up on top of each. Shuffle and place face up stacks of small and large building tiles. Separately shuffle the level 1, 2 and 3 fishing tiles and place the appropriately sized stacks into their slots in the fjord. All boats start in the harbour. That's on land, not in the fjord itself. Place one orange die per player into these slots. Those dice are not yet in play, their facing doesn't matter. Then roll all remaining dice and sort them according to the values rolled. Shuffle the eight ability tiles, placing four face up on the board. Finally, it's time for the starting draft. Place the other four ability tiles face up. Pair each of them with a starting resource tile and with a starting two size building. To distinguish these from the small buildings you placed earlier, these are the lighter coloured ones with no hammer on the back. Choose a first player and in reverse seating order each player chooses one set of tiles. Any leftover sets are returned to the box. From your chosen tiles, keep your ability tile beside your board this is an individual player power which you now have access to. Build your starter building tile in any orientation into the central four spaces of your board, showing these snow marks. And gain your starting resources. Here it's a grain, three fish and a paper, before returning this tile to the box. All resources in Saltfjord are tracked by keeping the generic cubes in the matching slots on your resource board. You're now ready to play. Saltfjord is played over three rounds, and each round is played in turns, starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table. On your turn, you choose one of three options, A, B or C. A is to choose a die from the board and use it to activate a row or column of buildings in your village. B is to construct a new large building in your village. And C is retire letting you choose a retirement action, then activate any trading benefits you've unlocked with previous crates. Retiring will be your last turn for the round, and once all players have retired, the round is over. The aim of the game is to score victory points, indicated by the wreath symbol. A green wreath is scored during the game, and a purple wreath is scored at the end. Whoever scores the most points over three rounds and final scoring will be the winner. 
So now let's look at each type of turn in detail. Turn A is to draft a die and use it to activate your village. First, choose a die from the rolled slots on the main board. That means this supply of orange dice is not available. From the rolled dice, you can choose white or orange, but you're not allowed to take more than three white dice for the round, nor can you take more than one orange die in round one. One row from the supply will get added to the pool in round two, so in round two you can take at most two orange dice, and all orange dice will have been added in round three, allowing you to take a maximum of three orange dice for the round. In this way there's always enough dice for everyone to take their full quota, but the earlier you take them, the better your choice will be. Bring your die to your board. You may now adjust its value up or down by spending fish. One pip per fish. You can spend multiple fish on a single die, but you can't wrap around between six and one. Now place the die in its matching row or column. Orange dice go in rows, and white dice go in columns. Then from left to right or top to bottom, move the die along and activate each building you encounter. That's a yellow or red roof. Resolve these buildings in order, and then once you reach the final building, leave the die in place. This blocks it out from being activated again this round. As such, if on my second turn I chose a white six, I would skip over this building. I would not resolve this boardwalk space because dice will only activate red and yellow buildings. I'd then get to activate this building and this building before leaving the die there. Alternatively, when you draft a die, you can simply keep it beside your board to gain a single fish. You'll rarely want to do this, but sometimes you really need a fish, or you're forced to take a die which has no buildings. Dice gained and spent in this way still count towards your limit of three white and one, two, or three orange for the round. So let's look at all the types of buildings and actions. Yellow buildings are resource buildings, and you simply gain the resource printed on them. This is usually the fish or the basic level 1 resources. Here, for example, I would gain a paper, a wood, a grain, and two fish. Some of the large buildings might give you access to the higher value products. For example, this one's worth planks, and others might be worth food or books. There's also this action here, which allows you to upgrade a single resource. Simply take any one of your resource cubes and advance it through the arrow to the next level. There's also a series of free actions which you can take at any time on your turn to manipulate your resources. You can always spend two fish to upgrade one resource. You can always downgrade a resource for free. For example, if I needed to spend two grain on something, I could first downgrade my food to grain. By the same token, that means that gold is wild, since you can always downgrade it to any one of the other resources. You can also sell a resource for the printed value of fish at any time. For example here, selling this book for two fish. The cog action allows you to develop technology. Choose a column, pay the next resource cost, and advance one step. You'll now gain either an immediate or ongoing benefit. For these two spaces, immediately gain the resources. And when you reach this space, gain one of the four ability tiles placed on the board in setup. You'll now have two abilities available for the rest of the game. I'll cover the remaining effects as part of the actions they're relevant to. Advancing on technologies gives you points at the end of the game, and once you've reached the top step of a track, those points are based on these end game scoring objective tiles. Most are resolved based on what you've collected or done, although there are two resolved immediately. This one gives you the points based on how quickly you reach the top of the track, and this one lets you sell fish for points at the moment you reach that space. The boat icon lets you take the fishing action, and each time you get this you have two options. You can either sail out or return home. If you sail out, move your boat from the harbour to the first section of the fjord, or from your current section over a wave break to the next section. 
Then collect the top token from the level 1 deck and add it to a slot in your boat. You don't own this resource yet, you have to bring it home through a separate fishing action before converting it to the resources. If your boat is full when you go fishing, you'll need to throw something overboard, either the token you just gained, or one you already had, putting it on the bottom of its stack in your current space. Once a stack is empty, that stack can no longer be fished. If you choose the return home option, then immediately gain the number of points in your current space of the fjord, return your boat to the harbour, and convert your catch into resources and points. So now I would gain the two fish and the one wood, while lobsters and squid are simply collected to gain their immediate points. There are four technologies which help you to fish. When you reach this space, flip your boat tile, retaining any tokens on it. As you fish, always rearrange your boat so that your single highest scoring token is on this multiplier space. And then when you return home to base, you double the points on that space. So this would be a five point haul. Once you have this tech, you have choice when you go fishing. You can look at the top two tiles from the stack, choose the one you wish to keep and return the other to the top of the stack. Once you reach this tech, you can start fishing from the level two pile and with this tech from the level three pile. The draw two, keep one bonus also still applies. The crate action allows you to fulfill an order. Choose any one order from the top of its stack, pay the cost in resources, and then note the action printed next to it, and place the token face down beside the corresponding pier. Then reveal the next crate from the stack. Under the standard action, nothing else happens. There are purple points on this tile, meaning you'll score them at the end of the game, and the action printed next to it is resolved when you retire, not when you place. However, there are two technologies which benefit you here. Once you've reached this step, you take the action printed next to the pier immediately when you place a crate. And once you have this tech, then any time you fulfill a crate, you can choose any one of the four piers to place it into not just the one which corresponds to where you took it from. The single hammer action allows you to construct a small building. The cost to do this is one wood and lets you take the top tile from any one of the four small building stacks and add it somewhere in your village. If this puts a red or yellow building to the right of or below the die you're activating, then you can activate that on this same turn. You can also spend a B turn building a large building, and that shows the double hammer icon. When you do this, you do not take or place a die. Your entire turn is doing this building, and you pay one wood and one plank, and again take the top tile from any one of the four stacks and place it in your grid. You can rotate a building to any orientation, but you can't cover or overlap any previously placed tile or a pre-printed icon. If this placement completely fills in a row or column with buildings and boardwalk spaces, it's at this moment that you gain the benefits from those boardwalk spaces. So here I'd gain a gold and a fish. If you have this tech, then all large and small building actions come with a one wood discount meaning large buildings cost a plank and small buildings are free. As a free action on any type of turn, you can activate a yellow or red building with a worker. Simply place the worker on the building and activate it. You cannot choose a building which is already blocked out by a die, and the worker also serves to block that building for the rest of the round. If I activated this white one, I would only get to resolve these two buildings. Workers, like dice, will be cleared at the end of each round. Each player begins the game with one worker, but gains a second and a third by reaching these steps on the technology track. You can use multiple workers on the same turn, but as usual, it's at most one worker or die per space. Your last turn in any round will always be to retire. Move your marker to an empty tavern space and resolve the action. The first three we've already seen, 
And the last one is to do two fishing actions in a row. The fourth action lets you build a one by one small building at no wood cost. Then from top to bottom, resolve each of your crates by taking the action next to that pier. So here, first I'd go fishing once, then I'd gain a fish and a point, and then I could make two sales of grain and food. So a food for five points and a grain for three. Your position in the turn sequence is skipped for the rest of this round. Once all players have retired, the round is over. Return all workers on your village board to your supply and clear off all the dice and reset the market by taking all of the previous round's dice and the next row of orange dice, rolling and placing them as you did in setup. Take tavern markers off the action spaces and whichever player placed in the leftmost space for the round becomes the new first player. Now continue playing from that player clockwise. Once the third round is complete, the game is over and you'll add up final scores. First, deal with resources. If your fishing boat is out in the fjord, then collect all resources and points on that boat, including the multiplier, so here I'd get four points. However, you don't get the points for the space on the fjord itself. Then, sell all of your leftover resources for their fish values, and gain three points per leftover fish. Next, score crates. For every column where you have one crate per row, you gain three points, and then you gain the points on all the crates themselves. So here it's three points for the column, and 26 for the crates. Finally, score your technologies. One point, four points, or points based on the objective for each column. The player with the highest score wins, and if tied, the leftmost final tavern space breaks the tie. Once you're familiar with the game, you can choose to add the Wagons module to play. In setup, place the Wagons overlay over the third tech track. This covers the text previously related to placing crates flexibly and replaces them with the Wagon text. Use two Wagons per player, placing one on the second tech space and the other in the top left corner of your board. Wagons can be moved around your board using dice to activate buildings. When you activate a column containing a wagon, you may first move the wagon one step left or right and resolve a building if it lands on one. Then you move and resolve the die. If you activate a row, you may first move the wagon one step up or down. Again, resolving the wagon's building before resolving the die. The wagon must move perpendicular to the direction of the die. If I wanted this one to move onto the wood space, I couldn't do that with this orange die. It would have to be with this white one. You may also choose not to move the wagon that's in the die's path if you wish. When you do this, you can activate the wagon's building first. This will be out of order and then activate the dies buildings, skipping over the wagons. This could be useful if, for example here, I needed the wagons resource to complete this crate. Wagons block spaces just like dice and workers. If I place this die here, I could not move the wagon left because the space is blocked by the worker. Wagons do not block you from constructing buildings, and you can build one underneath a wagon's position. Once you've researched the first technology, wagons can now activate boardwalks the same way they do buildings. So this placement would let me score two points before activating these buildings. The second tech lets you gain your second wagon. Place it in the top left space of your board, or off to the side if the space is not available. You'll move that straight into there as soon as it becomes unoccupied. Your second wagon activates the same way as the first, and if they both activate on the same turn, you can choose to activate them in either order. The third technology simply lets you immediately move each wagon once. You'll want to move your wagons as far down and to the right of the board as you can, since at game's end, each wagon scores points equal to the number in its column times the number in its row. And that's how to play Salt Fjord. Thanks so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know and share this video if you enjoyed and hopefully you have a great day. See you next time.